Today we are going to be jumping into the Hannah Gutierrez trial, and I apologize if I'm butchering her last name, I'm doing the best that I can, but uh, this is the case where Alec Baldwin, on the set of Rust, was practicing a cross draw with a weapon, a real live weapon. Now, there's supposed to only be dummies or blank rounds in the gun, but somehow some live ammunition ended up in his gun. The gun accidentally discharged and, tragically, killed Helena Hutchins. So now they are charging Hannah Gutierrez with involuntary manslaughter because she was in charge of armor. She was in charge of ammunition. She was in charge of the guns, and she should have checked the guns, checked the ammunition, make sure that they were only blank or dummy rounds going into the gun in the first place. So Hannah is being charged with involuntary manslaughter. Now we're going to be jumping into the opening statements. I know that evidence is already coming in. It's already, the trials already been going on for a few days. We're going to be breaking all that down also. But I thought that it was a very uh, important part that the defense failed to tell the jury about during opening statements. So we're going to jump into that a little bit more than near the end of the video because I want to just kind of break down the different arguments back and forth and then I'm going to tell you what I think after hearing all the arguments, what could have really changed the jury's mindset in this entire trial, throughout the entire trial, and which may have really helped the defense in this case. Now again, like I always do, I don't take sides. I'm not, I'm not on Hannah's side. I'm not on the other side, I'm just giving you my analysis as I'm looking at the lawyering and what I think could have been done better on, on each side. And I think the prosecution also made a mistake, which I'm also going to discuss also. But first, let's jump, just kind of set the stage for the different arguments that are going to be made on both sides. Also, by the way, the Michelle Traconis trial, uh, there we have closing arguments that happened today. The jury started deliberations and they're going to be continuing deliberations tomorrow. Maybe we'll have a verdict by tomorrow and I'll be able to react to everything, the closing arguments, which certainly there's some reactions there and to see what the eventual verdict is going to be if we get one tomorrow. So that's with the Michelle Traconis trial. But for today, let's just concentrate on the Hannah Gutierrez trial. So the state opened and the state said that really Hannah was hired in as to be part-time armor and part-time props assistant. Now, this is something that the defense ma uh, made a point of in their opening statements, where the defense said that really on a set like Rust, where there's so much guns, there's so much ammunition, there, this should have been a full-time job taken by the, uh, there should have been a full-time armor person, not just someone who's trying to juggle being an armor person and a props assistant person. So that was the first problem. The defense is going to say that, therefore, that shows that the production actually was negligent. They're trying to do things cheap, and they're trying to do things quickly, and therefore, really, it's production's fault. And the state is obviously going to be saying that, no, it was Hannah's fault. Now, think about it. If you want to go with that argument, if the defense wants to go with that argument and say that, really, this job should have been, the armor job should have been a full-time armor job. Well, shouldn't Hannah have realized that? And in fact, they say that Hannah did send an email. This is the defense. The defense says that Hannah did send an email to production saying that she needs more days to just deal with the armor and she can't really juggle both. And she even said, this is where mistakes happen. So on the one hand, you are showing that production perhaps is negligent here, but also you're showing that Hannah realized that she can't really perform this job responsibly. So that argument actually might bike backfire against the defense by saying if Hannah even knew that she was not able to perform this job as an armor, as, as an, as an armor person responsibly, that right away should send red flags saying that she even realized herself that she's not able to do this job. So you got to be careful with that argument. But let's continue. So the state's the state opens and says that there's different types of rounds. There's blank rounds, there's dummy rounds, and there's live rounds. And they say that every round has to be checked. That's the armor's job responsibility is to check to make sure that each round that's going in is a blank round or a dummy round. And there are ways to determine whether the round is live or if it is a blank round or a dummy round. And the way to do that is by looking at the bullet itself. If you look or if you look at the bullet, and number one, if it has a hole in it, if it has a hole in it, that's a clear indication that it's not a live bullet. That's number one. Number two is that you can shake it. In a dummy round, The if you shake it, there's a little ball inside, and you can hear the ball rattling. If it's gunpowder in there, then you don't hear any balls rattling. You might be able to hear some gunpowder 
moving around, perhaps, but uh, certainly you're not going to hear a ball rolling around. If you hear a ball rolling around, then you know that uh, that it's a blank or it's a, it's a dummy round. Another way is that if it's missing a primer, the primer is in the back of the bullet. There's in the middle of the bullet. If it's silver, then it's that's an indication that it's a live bullet. If it's brass or if it's missing a primer, then that would be an indication that it's a it's a uh, dummy round. So this is something that she should be able to check to make sure that each bullet is a blank or dummy round. Another thing is that she's supposed to present the firearm to the first assistant director to make sure that they're only dummy rounds. So she's not supposed to hand the gun straight to the actor. She gives it to the first assistant director, which, by the way, happened here. And they acknowledge that this happened here. But they say that a lot of times she actually did not do that. She skipped that step. Um, also, they're supposed to uh, give the actor the opportunity to get the gun inspected to make sure that there's only dummy rounds in there. So, October 21st, 2021. That's when this terrible accident happened. And it was a chaotic day. Why was it a chaotic day? Because the night before, a bunch of camera people sent an email to production saying, they're done. They're quitting. Why? Because they have safety concerns. This is the night before this accident. And what did the producers do? They pushed through anyway. They got some new, uh, they, they got some new camera people and they were going to film anyway with maybe less camera equipment. Okay. So the morning session goes by uneventfully. Then there's lunch. After lunch, they're doing something called blocking. Blocking is the step before rehearsal. So there's blocking, rehearsal, and then I guess the actual shot, meaning the shot of the, of the camera. So during the blocking, the state points out, there's not even a need to use a real gun. A lot of times during blocking, the actor just uses whatever he has, a tool or not anything. He just, he's just going through the motions about what he's going to be doing or she's going to be doing during the actual scene before even rehearsal. So you don't even need an actual gun. Now, they say that, you know, they, they could use a gun, but it's not absolutely necessary. So that's number one. Hannah didn't even need to give Alec a gun for this, the blocking that he's doing. Now, she did hand the gun to the first assistant director, and he, they say that, this is the state, the state says that they did a sloppy check. They didn't really check. They didn't remove the ammunition. They just did a, they, they spun it around to look at the ammunition, kind of eyeball it, and decide that it is that it's fine. Now, also something else that they point out is that before lunch, there was only five rounds that were in that gun. And after lunch, Hannah cleaned out the sixth. There was really able to take six rounds and they only had five loaded at the time. And she took the time to clean, clean out that other, uh, the blank, the one that was empty and fill it with another round of ammunition. So, they go through this process. She, she gives it to the first director. They just do a quick, quick check on the ammunition. And then they handed it to Alec and the rest, as we know, is history. Now, another thing that they point out is that Hannah was always disorganized. And if you take a look, they have a picture of the cart, her cart, which she has all of her ammunition and things just lying around. Everything's in disarray. It's disorganized. And it's not exactly what you want your ammunition, your armor person to be. You want the armor person to be very organized to make sure that everything's, you know, clearly marked what's going in, what's going out. You want to make, you know, you want to see organization when you're the army person. And that's another thing that they're pointing out is that she was always disorganized. Now, a very big question is going to be, where did this live ammunition come from? How did it get on the set in the first place? Obviously, you're not supposed to have live ammunition on the set. So how did this lab ammunition get there in the first place? And not only that, not only was this the only bullet that was actually live ammunition on the set, but after checking through all the other ammunition, uh, all, all the other ammunition on, on the set, they found six other live bullets that were on this set. That well, certainly looks like an accident waiting to happen. So they say that her father texted her a picture of the ammunition he had at home, which is identical to the one that she had on set, which seems to suggest that Hannah got this ammunition from her father. And we're going to talk about her father in a minute. So she got this ammunition from her father 
and she brought that on set herself. So she really is the cause that brought this live ammunition on the set. She didn't check it carefully enough, and that's how this live ammunition ended up in Alec Baldwin's gun. Now, they ended off the opening statement with something, I think, pretty powerful, and they showed a excerpt from her deposition. And in that excerpt, she says in her deposition, I wish I would have checked it more. And the prosecution says, so do we. And they sat down. So nice way to end it. Nice, strong way to end their opening statement. So now the defense opens. And the defense makes a point of saying that everybody understands in gun safety that you never point a gun at anybody unless you actually want to shoot that person. So Alec Baldwin has business knowing that you never point this gun at anybody. Why did he point that gun at Helena Hutchins? That's his fault. He should have never pointed the gun at anybody. And in fact, the defense makes a point of saying that in all these videos where you see all these movies where it looks like actors are pointing the guns at other actors in the movie, they're actually not really doing that. They're actually not pointing the guns at that actor. There's just with the trick photography, it looks like they're doing that, but they're not actually doing that. So the fact that this accident happened was really in large part due to Alec Baldwin not following basic safe gun safety by not pointing the gun at anybody. And in fact, Alec Baldwin is not a newbie. He's been handling guns for, what, 30 years? How long has he been an actor for? He should know this. So that's a point that they make. Also, they said that OSHA investigated, and they found n- numerous mistakes with production. And they gave them the largest fine in history for all of the mistakes that production had on this set. So the defense essentially is saying that this is not Hannah's fault. She was thrust in a situation which was a, a, a situation where an accident was sure going to happen and it's all production's fault. It wasn't Hannah's fault. Also, something interesting, Sarah Zachary was the head of props. So Sarah Zachary is really the boss for Hannah. And Sarah Zachary, as the head of props, her job is that she has to source the ammunition and firearms. She has to make sure Where is this ammunition coming from? Where are these guns coming from? It's her responsibility. It's Sarah Zachary's responsibility, not necessarily Hannah's responsibility. He, they also say, this is the defense, they also say that this is something that that Hannah wanted Alec Baldwin to train more with this cross draw in the first place. The cross draw, where you're going across your whole body, is a very dangerous draw. And Hannah actually wanted Alec to take more training on this, and Alec refused. He didn't, he didn't care for it. So again, it's another thing that Alec didn't do right. Also, another very important part that the defense made, and we keep, we're, seeing, we're seeing this in evidence also come up, is that you're not necessarily able to check by, doing, by just looking at the bullets themselves and shaking the bullets themselves that that's automatically going to tell you whether a bullet is live or if it's a a dummy or a blank. You can't just tell that by shaking it. Now, yeah, if it shakes and there's a ball inside, that will tell you that, but that's not, it's not for sure that just because there's no ball in there that that is automatically a live ammunition, or just because there's no hole hole in in the the ammunition that is automatically a, uh, a live bullet. And this is a point that they're gonna bring out also during their case. Another interesting thing is that production ordered all of the ammunition from somebody called Seth Kelly, Kenny. Seth Kenny, who's Seth Kenny? Seth Kenny, apparently he's a supplier for ammunition, and he was actually working with Hannah's father. Who's Hannah's father? Hannah's father is a person named Thel Reed. Thel Reed is a real big, apparently he's a very big gun expert, and he's trained people like Brad Pitt, Denzel Washington, Sharon Stone. He was the armor in Tombstone, this movie Tombstone. And he's, he's this guy that really knows what he's doing. So Seth, Thel Reed was working with Seth Kenny on a movie called Yellowstone 1883 right before Rust. And they had live ammunition on that set. And 
part of the reason why they had that live ammunition was to train the actors because they want to give the actors a feeling for what it really is. Now, they don't actually use those live ammunition during the set. They take them to other ranges to practice just so that they can get used to the gun. So they actually had this live ammunition. Now, again, Seth Kelly, remember, Seth Kelly is the main supplier for the ammunition for Rust. And Seth Kelly was working with Thel Reed, and they had some live ammunition. So it's very likely the defense is making a case. It's very likely that some of this ammunition that they that the production of Thrust ordered from Seth Kenny was actually live ammunition. And it's not really that Hannah got it from her father. Now, also another point of it is to show that Hannah, since her father was this big armor expert and expert in ammunition and guns, so she was actually very experienced in this and that she didn't really do it. She didn't, it wasn't like this newly inexperienced armor person. She was, she knew her way around guns. She knew her way around ammunition. And therefore that would tell you that she actually doesn't, does know what she's doing. And really she was not at fault here. Now, another interesting thing that happened is that after the shooting, after this whole incident, there's been some phone calls between Sarah Zachary and Seth Kenny. So there was some communication between the two and we don't know what that communication is that's what the defense said we don't really know what that communication was why didn't the police get their phones and see what type of communication happened between seth kenny and sarah zachary you see, you see that they were in touch with each other right after this happened and in fact they said that sarah actually took stuff from the prop cart after this after this shooting and there was some box of ammunition from seth kenny there so Sarah Zachary is all of a sudden taking stuff from the prop cart, moving it around. What's going on there? It seems like she's trying to cover her tracks. So you got that. So essentially, that's what the case comes down to. The state's going to make the case that, look, at the end of the day, Hannah was in charge of her armor. She was required to check that ammunition to make sure that they're dummies and blank rounds and not live ammunition. And she didn't do her job properly, she didn't check it well enough, and therefore that's why this all happened. Now, this is where I think there is a big mistake that happened. Anybody who's been watching my videos, and by the way, if you haven't subscribed yet, you gotta subscribe and help out the video and help out the channel and like the video. So here's, here's the issue. Number one, anybody who's been watching my videos knows that you gotta tell the jury what the burden of proof is. You gotta explain to them what the standard here is. Now, I know during jury selection, this is done, and you explain to the jury that the burden here is beyond a reasonable doubt, and it's a very high standard, and yeah, you talk about that during jury selection, but as the prosecutor, when you wanna present your case, what you gotta do is, this should be done in every case, if you're the prosecutor. You should get up there and tell the jury, I know we spoke about the burden of proof in this case during jury selection. Maybe you want to preface by that. I know we spoke about that, but let me just reiterate that this is a very high standard. It's higher than a preponderance of the evidence. It's higher than clear and convincing. It's the highest standard, and we, we, we know that. And that's the society that we want to live in. We want to live in this type of society where we have to prove our case beyond a reasonable doubt because we don't want innocent people sitting in prison. So we... We appreciate that as the prosecution. We want that. We want to live in that type of society. But when the evidence is in in this case, we have no problem because you are going to see so clearly that the evidence is going to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. You're going to have no doubt at all in your minds that Hannah is guilty in this case. And as a prosecution, you should say that. And as a defense, you should also get up and you should talk to them about the reasonable that, that there's beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's what they have to prove their case by. And you hammer it home. And it's, such, it's the highest standard. And even if you're convinced, you may, you may feel satisfied that this is clear and convincing evidence. But that's not good enough. It's just not good enough. It has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. If you have any reasonable doubt that maybe it wasn't Hannah or maybe Hannah is not to be blamed for this murder, then you have to acquit her. And if you think that you said reasonable, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt too many times, say it one more time because the jury has to really have that ingrained in their, in their psyche. That's what you really want them to be thinking about. 
So as the defense, you got to mention that during opening statement, and I don't think it was stressed enough during the defense's opening statement. But here, that's just, okay. But here, I think we want to take it another step. And that is that here, what is the charge? Let's think about the charge. Does anybody know on the jury what Hannah is being charged with? This isn't a regular murder case. This is, she's being charged with involuntary manslaughter. What is involuntary manslaughter? Did anybody explain that to the jury? And yes, I know the judge reminded the jury what the, Hannah is being charged with before opening statements. And you're right. She did kind of explain it. But you have to explain it more because it wasn't, it wasn't enough. So let me, let's break down what exactly is involuntary manslaughter. And then if the jury has this understanding of what involuntary manslaughter is, then as the evidence comes in, they're able to understand whether, and they're able to weigh it as the evidence comes in, whether this actually, whether the state satisfied their burden of proving that Hannah is guilty of involuntary manslaughter. So let's start from the beginning. What is involuntary manslaughter? Involuntary manslaughter consists of manslaughter committed in the commission of an unlawful act, not amounting to a felony. So it's an unlawful act, perhaps a misdemeanor. So that's one way and ends up in a murder. Or in the commission of a lawful act, which might produce death in an unlawful manner or without due caution and circumspection. So you may be doing something 100% lawful, but if in the way that you're acting, you're acting without due caution and circumspection, and that results in a, in a murder and a death, then that's also considered involuntary manslaughter. What does that mean? Okay, thank you. Now, now what does that mean? So you have to take it the next step, which is in the jury instructions. And this is what it, the, the law in New Mexico is. The required mens rea for a conviction of involuntary manslaughter is criminal negligence. Now, this is clear in New Mexico law. You cannot be found guilty of involuntary manslaughter if you're not found to have acted with criminal negligence. Okay, now we're starting to understand things a little bit better. So you, you have to find that Hannah was criminally negligent, not just negligent. Negligence, one, one, one step. Then there's criminally negligent. What's negligence? Negligence is you were not acting with ordinary care for the safety of others. That's negligence. What's criminal negligence? Does anybody know what criminal negligence is? No, but you have to go to the jury instructions. So this is what it says. The uniform jury instruction on criminal negligence incorporates this definition. Defining criminal negligence as existing. So here we go. This is what criminal negligence is. When a person acts with willful disregard of the rights or safety of others. So if you're the defense attorney, you got to get up there and tell the jury, you have to find that Hannah was criminally negligent. As you're listening to the testimony, as you're seeing the evidence come in, you should be weighing in your mind whether this amounts to Hannah acting criminally negligent, which means that she willfully disregarded the safety of others. Not just that she wasn't careful enough, that she didn't act with due care, she should have been more careful, maybe she should have done a few more checks. No, that's not enough. You have to find that she willfully disregarded the safety of others. Willfully. That is a much higher standard than just negligence. And if the jury understands this from the beginning, then as the defense, you can already be starting to make points, certainly in your opening statements already. If you explain this in the beginning of your opening statement, and then you explain to them, well, if, we, if she didn't know, if she had no reasonable, reasonable belief that there was actually live ammunition on the set, or if she reasonably believed that Alec Baldwin understood basic gun safety to never point the gun at anybody, did she willfully disregard the safety of others? Should she expect Alec Baldwin to act without gun safety? Someone who's an experienced actor? And should she reasonably believe that there's live ammunition? You're right. She should have done a million checks. She should have checked it and, shake, sh and, and shaken it and looked to see if there's any holes. She, right, she should have done all that. But if she had a reasonable belief 
that number one, there's no live ammunition on the set. And number two, that Alec Baldwin would have acted a little bit more careful as an experienced actor should have. Does that mean that she willfully disregarded the safety of others? So now already, if I think the defense would have explained that to the jury, I think the jury would have been hearing a lot of this evidence very differently than they're hearing it now. Now it could be they're gonna argue this in closing arguments, but at that point it could be too late. It could be that they already made up their minds and it's hard to change your mind. This has to be done by opening statements. So I think that this was a mistake. The defense should have explained to the jury what involuntary manslaughter is. You're allowed to do that during opening statements. You're allowed to explain what the charges there are, what the elements are, and what's required to be proven during opening statements. So that I think should have been done. So that is just what I wanted to point out to you about these opening statements. Yes, we are going to be continuing to follow this trial and discuss some of the evidence that comes in. I know I haven't been following it, so we'll catch you up into that. Also, again, we're also going to be following the Michelle Traconis verdict as that comes in. We'll bring that all, all to you as well. Um, if you haven't yet, please like, subscribe, and we will see you next time.